It's December 7th, 2019, and thank you for joining us for this archive of today's Teaching American History American Minds webinar. Today's webinar was about author and activist Harriet Beecher Stowe, and to discuss her ideas, her letters, and her impact on American society and politics, we were joined by Dr. Chris Burkett, Dr. David Krugler, and Dr. William Allen. Thanks for listening. So, welcome everyone to another teachingamericanhistory.org Saturday webinar. These are sponsored by the Ashbrook Center at Ashland University. TAH.org is the leading online resource for the documents-based study of American history, government, and civics for teachers, students, and citizens. I'm Chris Burkett. I teach here at uh, Ashland University uh, in both the master's program and on the undergraduate level. And uh, happy to be always uh, fortunate to be part of these webinars uh, the first Saturday of every month. Um, so I get to have some great conversations with some great minds and um, get to think about some important, interesting questions. Um, so speaking of minds, the theme, as you know, if you've joined us before, the theme of this year's webinar series is American Minds. And our purpose is to pull together some thoughtful scholars. Um, in this case, we have two very thoughtful uh, scholars uh, and thinkers, uh, Bill Allen of Michigan State University Emeritus and David Krugler of the University of Wisconsin Platteville. And so we pull together some interesting thinkers and we have what I hope will be an interesting, lively conversation about what I'm sure will be an interesting, lively conversation about, again, what we're calling this year American Minds. And if you're not familiar with that phrase, we're, our inspiration from, for that term, American Minds, comes from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to Henry Lee in which uh, Thomas Jefferson said that the Declaration of Independence was meant to be an expression of the American mind. And so we are discussing 10 uh, persons in US history who have uh, either uh, influenced that mind or helped to shape that American mind or who somehow reveal that American mind in their words and actions. Um, for all of you joining us today, I encourage you to join in the conversation by submitting questions in the chat box. We will try to get to as many of those as possible. Please, if you submit a question in the chat box, make sure you submit it to everyone, not just me privately. And that way our panelists today, Dr. Allen and Dr. Krugler, if they see a question in the chat box and they'd like to jump right to it and address it, that way they have access to those questions as well. In the next week, you will receive an email with a link to request a certificate of participation <clears throat> excuse me, as well as a link to the archive video and audio from today's program. So again, gentlemen, thank you both very much again for being here. Really appreciate your time. And uh, we're talking about somebody who I'll be honest, I know very little about. Uh, I mean, I know who Harriet Beecher Stowe is, obviously. I know she was an abolitionist and I know she wrote one of the most important books uh, of all time in Uncle Tom's Cabin. I have read the book. Um, Dr. Allen, I have read your book on the book, <laughs> so I'm hoping we can draw on some of those insights as well today. Um, but um, I, I honestly don't know much about uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe in terms of who she was and why she was the way she was. What I'm really interested in why, maybe we'll start with this broad question uh, for either of you to, uh, to start with. Um, why did she, why was she an abolist? An abolitionist, I'm sorry, why was she an abolitionist? And and what kind of abolist, abolitionist was she? And maybe as a follow-up question, uh, at some point, hopefully we can, we can um, ask, why did she write Uncle Tom's Cabin? What was her purpose in that? So would either of you like to um, get us thinking about Harriet Beecher Stowe, who she was and why she uh, is worthy of being included in this list of American minds? I would certainly be willing to open that discussion. And, Please, thank you. You know, uh, Chris, that's certainly the principal function of my book, Rethinking Uncle Tom. And the one thing I want to underscore at the outset for everyone is the important message that Harriet Beecher Stowe was not a one night wonder. Right. This was not just something that was thrown off in a spontaneous moment of emotional reaction to the news of the day. He had been growing in attention to this subject. Of course, in a family that was filled with abolitionists, 
And then and moreover, as someone who as early as 1836 had written an anonymous essay, the Franklin essay in Cincinnati, protesting some of the mob rule that was growing up in reaction to the abolitionist movement. So she was part of the movement. And one of the reasons I've asked the participants today to read the 1878 introduction is because that is her way of telling this story. And interestingly, she chooses to tell the story not by referring to all the intervenient writings before Uncle Tom's Cabin, the Franklin essay, the Two Altars essay, Uncle Sam's Emancipation, the long buildup before you get to Uncle Tom's Cabin. She tells the story in terms of the abolitionist movement itself, the struggles of her husband in the church over slavery, her responses to it. And of course, she frankly declares the mission of emancipation. So her self-understanding was the understanding of someone who was dedicated to accomplishing the specific objective. And Uncle Tom's Cabin is the key moment in that mission. We've lost your audio, Chris. I apologize. Yeah, thank you for that. I was just going to say, it's. Uh, she wrote a lot of other interesting things, um, uh, several novels, a lot of articles. And in fact, um, Uncle Tom's Cabin if I remember correctly, began as a, as was a serial, newspaper serial, was right, correct? So it sort of came out in installments before it was finally published in book form. But, but Bill, you're pointing out that this was not a, a sort of spontaneous uh, thing. This was part of her character in a way as it had been established and formed uh, in, you know, from her youth on, right? This was part, this is really a reflection of who she was. Very much so. And yeah. you spoke at the opening about Thomas Jefferson's invocation of the American mind. Her project was part of trying to shape the American mind. Mm. She partnered with her husband, Calvin Stowe, who published an essay in 1838 that was entitled, in effect, Winning the Mind at the West. So it was uh, a conscious attempt to develop an American mind, which came to center on the question of slavery, much the way Abraham Lincoln saw it as crucial to developing the American mind. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. And I know, I know, Bill, in, in your book, one of the uh, central arguments that you make is that um, her larger purpose, her immediate, well, I'm not sure how to put this, one of her purposes was to affect abolition, yes. in, right, in terms of promoting it and pushing the country toward abolition, but also uh, putting the country back on the path of being what she thought America truly was, right? Which I, which I loved uh, that that argument. She had an under, certain understanding of what America should have been, right? Or was meant to be in a way. And the existence of slavery uh, was uh, was a detriment to actually living up to what America, sort of the, the, the America that was uh, expressed by Jefferson and others through the principles of the American founding, so. Yeah, you, you, you captured that beautifully. And, and she, of course, expressed it dramatically. Yes. Opening Uncle Tom's Cabin with a picture of George Washington on the wall of Tom's Cabin uh, by structuring the debate between herself, in effect, and George Harris, which was actually the recreation of a live historical debate between herself and Frederick Douglass. Because George uh, Harris's exclamation, what country have I? was in fact Frederick Douglass's exclamation. Yeah, amazing. The whole dramatic process is nothing doing nothing but addressing the live contemporary historical debate. And she's answering the question, you do have a country and here's how we can understand it. Wow, that's amazing. So that, that raises another interesting question while we're waiting for participants to submit some questions here for either of you. Um, uh, David, maybe you know this too. Um, uh, do you know about, uh, can you say something about the relationship Harriet Beecher Stowe had with Frederick Douglass? I know we've asked students or uh, participants to read um, a letter from Frederick Douglass to uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe. Uh, did they know, were they acquaintances? I know they were fellow abolitionists. How well did they know each other and how much, uh, uh, I mean, clearly um, they knew each other in a certain way, uh, Bill, as you're pointing out here, right? And they had a kind of mutual respect for each other. But um, what was their relationship like? I, I think one of the interesting aspects of their relationship, and this is clearly shown in the letter, 
is that we see Stowe's intentionality in writing the novel that she doesn't just want to make uh, a literary impact. She wants to really change the trajectory of the country and, and, and force it to fulfill its principles and ideals. And so when she meets uh, Douglas, she asks, what, what can I do for you and your people? And, and we see Douglas crafting uh, a very encouraging reply uh, to her in which he's offering a specific program that she can help fulfill. And you see lots of foreshadowing of the purposes of the Tuskegee Institute under Booker T. Washington. Yeah. Douglas is talking, <coughs> excuse me, about the need for uh, an industrial uh, college for African-American uh, youth. And, you know, he puts out that goal that, um, you know, what are the problems that we face, self-reliance, racial prejudice, uh, and uh, getting, um, getting the skills we need to, to prove our worthiness to the nation. Yeah, that's a great point. He says, uh, even in looking at the second paragraph of that letter, um, in response again to her question, as you point out, David, what can, what can we do? What can I do? What can be done? And he says, uh, first, let me, first of all, let me briefly state the nature of the disease before I undertake to prescribe the remedy. Three things are notoriously true of us as a people. These are poverty, ignorance, and degradation. Um, so he points out the problem. But what struck me about this paragraph is just a little bit further down, about halfway through that second paragraph, he, um, he says, uh, I assert then that poverty, ignorance, and degradation are the combined evil or in other words, these constitute the social disease of the free colored people in the United States. To deliver them from this triple malady is to improve and elevate them, by which I mean simply to put them on an equal footing with their white fellow countrymen in the sacred right to, and he quotes, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end quote. So what struck me here is, is uh, Douglas's habit of uh, of referring to and drawing from the principles of the Declaration of Independence and the principles of the American founding. And he does this immediately in, in his letter to Harriet Beecher Stowe um, uh, to frame the problems. The question she asks is, what can we do? Uh, Douglas frames the, the problem in light of the principles of the American founding. And, um, and I think that's something she took seriously as well. I, again, I, um, a central theme of, of Dr. Allen's book, I think is that point um, as well. Um, let, let me just underscore what you're saying by pointing out please. to everyone that in a mere four years from 1848 to 1852, we witnessed this transition taking place in Douglas. In 1848, in the What Country Have I speech, he rejects all connection with the Constitution and the Declaration, still somewhat under the influence of the Garrisonian wing of abolitionism. But by the time of 1852 to 1854, he's able to deliver that speech, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, where he's matured his thinking. And that mature thinking takes place in the context of this correspondence with Stowe and appraising the effect of her novel. Remember that his colleague, at his newspaper, Martin Delaney was horrified by the novel and, and, and wrote you know, violently against it because Delaney didn't appreciate the way black people were depicted in the novel. But Douglas responded to Delaney in effect saying, the point is not to portray black people, the point is to change white people. And she uh, was very effectively. Yeah. That, that raises an interesting question. Do um, either of you know, how did, uh, so the novel is very graphic and detailed um, in its depiction of, of, the, of a, a, the life of a slave and the slave system. And, and of course, every, you know, the, 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 the process by which fugitive slaves are hunted down and pursued and these things. How did Harriet Beecher Stowe acquire that knowledge? Um, because I know there were some who were critical and I, again, I'm, I'm separating some of the literature from the South about the novel, which said she really doesn't know what she's talking about. But, but um, some of it I have to assume is accurate. 
and hopefully, you know, maybe most of it. I'm sort of an old fashioned historian where the facts don't matter as much as Bill, as you were just saying, the moral of the story sometimes, right? But uh, but how did she know? How did she acquire her knowledge of of uh, of slavery? Um, she was from Connecticut. I know she lived in Cincinnati, but she was a Northerner, so. Um, well, David may want to speak to that, uh, but I would certainly add a note that Cincinnati is the crossroads of the transition from slavery to freedom. Yeah. At a certain point, a part, an important part of the Underground Railroad ran, ran through Cincinnati, and the stoves actually gave shelter to people making the passage in their home. So she certainly knew from that perspective, and she also knew from the debates, because remember, it was Theodore Dwight Weld, and a number of people who were at Lane Seminary, where her father was in fact the president and her husband on the faculty, that they're the ones who rebelled because they didn't think the stand at Lane was strong enough. And so they went off and founded Oberlin College. So they were right mm. in the middle of this debate and all everything that was taking place. I see. Uh, to, to add to that, in, in the novel, at the end of the novel, Stowe includes concluding remarks. And it's, it's interesting to note that she cites a certain authority by the name of Professor C. E. Stowe, then of Lane Seminary, Ohio, without letting the reader know that this is her husband, right. Calvin Stowe. But in this this uh, you know note to readers, in which she's essentially providing a bibliography and, and providing evidence, citing her husband, she says, with regard to emancipated slaves now resident in Cincinnati, given to show the capability of the race, even without any particular is assistance or encouragement. And quote the following examples are given, and then she uses initials. But there's there's um, a whole page of of actual um, individuals uh, who yeah. were held as slaves and, and have now been uh, emancipated. Uh, most of them through their own efforts. Okay. Interesting themselves. And you should out. add to that, by the way, David, the importance of observing that she had written the key to Uncle Tom's cabin in the immediate aftermath, in defense of the novel bringing out all of the historical examples about the character of slavery to refute precisely the people who said her account was unrealistic. Yeah. She was intensely devoted in this work. Deep, deep research. Remember, The Key is published in 1853. The novel appeared in 1852. And in, in the year after The Key appeared, that's the year she traveled to England was once she published The Key, there, she published Sunny Memories, all reinforcing the theme so we can see how intensely she worked on this. This was casually thrown off. Yes. Uh, you know, this might be a good point to bring up a couple of questions we've received. Please, yeah, I was just going to do that. Yeah. Um, we've got one question asking who had more of an impact in, in abolition and, and leading to an end to slavery? Uh, Henry Lloyd, or uh, excuse me, William Lloyd Garrison. Harriet Beecher Stowe or, or Frederick uh, Douglass, and a related question, to what extent was Stowe's, uh, excuse me, Beecher's father uh, a, an influence on her in abolition? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, that one, the one's a, <laughs> pick, pick between Garrison and Beecher Stowe and Frederick Douglass, that's a tough one. Yeah, very much uh, so. But before you answer those questions, David, uh, or Chris, I'm not seeing any of the questions. So I need to do something and I don't know how to do it. <laughs> oh, you can't see that? Um, yeah. There is, uh, boy, I'm the worst person to ask these questions. At, at, at the very bottom of your, your screen, under the, the list of panelists, uh, Bill, hopefully you see a, an orange chat sign with a little arrow. Right. And if you click on the arrow, then it'll it'll take the video away, and then you'll see the the questions, and then you can just close close it. it. Thank you, thank you. Got it. Good. Thanks, David. Appreciate yes. it. I wouldn't even know how to do that. <laughs> so, so by the way, I was as uh, this is um, until very recently, I had actually had no idea that Lyman Beecher was her father. Uh, oh yeah, that was an amazing revelation to me. So. Um, clearly, that I mean that had to have had an impact on her. Edward Beecher, Henry Ward Beecher. Yeah. And remember the Alton, Illinois riots? Her brother was there with Elijah Lovejoy. So wow. The whole family was caught up in the abolitionist movement. Hmm. Henry Ward Beecher is the one who held the slave auctions in his church at Riverside, New York. So, so they were all committed to it. Lyman was, in a sense, the weakest of the whole family in terms of activism, 
Mm. Excuse me, did preach. And part of the difficulty is the, the whole Beecher Stowe clan are abolitionists from the point of view of reinforcing the precept, hate the sin, but not the sinner. Mm. At odds with the more radical members of the Presbyterian church, as well as the secular abolitionists, who wanted nothing to do with slaveholders as well as slave holding. Right. So that's how the debate developed. And the novel was meant to precisely address those questions. So where did where did Harriet fall in that? She, she was un I mean, I'm asking a huge question here. You said the novel reveals this debate somehow. Uh, do we do you have a sense of where Harriet fell? Was she of the uh, love the sinner, hate the sin? view of her father or did she fall more down the road of what I would call sort of the Garrisonians? Um, she was definitely on her father and more particularly her husband's side. Okay. The whole okay. key to Uncle Tom's Cabin is a defense of Calvin Stowe. Oh, okay. There Interesting. Partners in this work. Huh. I did, Okay. That's fascinating. Huh. Um, so she was, she had to have been familiar with Garrison. Um, uh as a as an abolitionist but um with what, what what i've been finding fascinating recently is the sort of divisions among abolitionists uh because we can we can see the distinction between an abolitionist generally speaking and somebody like abraham lincoln who was who did not think of himself as an abolitionist because he was more focused on ending the spread of slavery in other territories um with abolition maybe to follow right but in the abolition movement, you have this. I didn't. I wasn't aware of the distinction you just made, Bill. Uh, there were apparently there were, were there divisions among them in terms of uh, colonization. There were coloniz colonization abolitionists, and there were what I'm assuming would be the Harriet Beecher Stowe types who were who were for um, former slaves finding their country in America, as you were saying earlier. Um, yeah, in fact, that was why Martin Delaney criticized her, partly because of the colonization that she gave a nod to when she uh, George Harris to go off to yes. Africa. But, but that was not a sufficient understanding of the novel because she established the capacities of people to live in the United States. She didn't make it a requirement that they leave. Uh, the this movement was one of those in-between things where you had people like John Quincy Adams or James Madison who, who supported colonization. And, and it wasn't always clear from which perspective the, those supporters supported it, whether it was from the Jefferson Madison perspective of wanting to get rid of this problem altogether, or whether it was just to mollify sentiment in some degree, to, to, to mitigate the harmful consequences of the presence of slavery. But for Stowe, colonization was clearly an option that had to be acknowledged in order to sustain the argument against slavery itself. But mm. it wasn't something that she particularly advocated for, because we saw that in her campaign in England, and she chastised the people of England of being not quite hot enough about the question of slavery. Right. Yeah, I think, you know, to build off uh, Bill's commentary, uh, with, with that story point in which George Harris chooses to go to, to uh, Liberia, uh, it, it's a choice, right? He's proven his ability to succeed, making the escape, thriving in Canada, starting a family. And, and to me as a reader, in looking at the, uh, the text as a novel, that's Stowe's way of signaling colonization is an appropriate pathway, but it can't be required or mm -hmm. that all African Americans forced into it. Yeah, I concur completely. And I think it's really so important for people to immerse themselves in the novel and see the dynamic tension between Tom and George. Because George himself expressly declares he can't possibly begin to act as a freeman while he's still in the atmosphere of slavery. Hmm. What Tom rises to is the challenge of proving the value of individuality and freedom, even in the condition of slavery. Mm -hmm order to establish that we don't need to defend the humanity of black people because like all human beings they are invested morally and spiritually with what is required to say no to slavery the way tom does when he's immediately taken into the company of, of simon Legree, right. and Tom defies him from the outset 
but by refusing to sing body secular hymns and singing um, Methodist hymns, even when Le warned him not to. And that all, all leads to Tom declaring, you have the papers to my body, but you cannot own my soul. And Stone yeah. wanted to make this point, the question of soul ownership was the important question, not yeah. the material condition. So, so we, we recognize George and we accept the humanity of that, but that's the question of material conditions. The ultimate yeah. defense of equality is the freedom of the soul. Yeah. And, and here's really, where, go ahead, Dan. I'm sorry, David. I mean, yeah, it, here's where Stowe as a novelist is really uh, taking major risks because it's it it takes a great deal of skill for a novelist to render fully rounded, believable characters who exemplify spiritual qualities. And on the one hand, a criticism can be made uh, of her uh, creative choices that that Tom is overtly a Christ-like figure. Um, and I think that often gets overlooked. Tom is criticized as being so passive in acceptance of the horrors inflicted upon him, but the larger purpose here for Stowe is, is to to present him as a, as a Christ-like figure and then to fulfill uh, the things uh, Bill uh, just uh, said. Um, but she's able to do that, and she offers this counterpoint through the figure of George Harris, who's very much an earthly individual and is focused on on, on his existence as a human being in the here and now. And, and there are several points in the novel where he's asserting this uh, mm -hmm. as he makes his escape and as, as he builds a life. I mean, there's this great conversation where he's posing um, as, as a Spaniard and he runs into his old boss who he, whom he had been hired out to and who doesn't reveal his identity but says, you're taking great risks. And, and Stowe uses that to have a, uh, a political discussion, really, mm -hmm. uh, in which the former boss is representing the well, this is dangerous. Maybe we should go slowly, you know. And 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 uh, George is saying, "What does this nation stand for? Am I not a man?" That's great. Those are great points, David. And I'm especially love how you bring up those aspects of the novel. Being a novelist yourself, um, by the way, if, if if you have not read David's novels, I can't recommend them strongly enough. Uh, you have two out now, right? Is that right? Uh, yes, two. Two. Okay. Um, but the, uh, the, but look, just I'm just following up on your point, or I guess maybe reinforcing or agreeing with your point. Those conversations, it's it it strikes me that those kinds of conversations may never actually have taken place. I mean, to, in my mind, it's hard for me to imagine some people in those actual positions having those sort of high-minded conversations. But on the other hand, it doesn't matter because of Stowe's skill as a writer. Um, they're both entirely believable and uh, and 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 the central to the novel, right? Because they reveal what uh, not only the sort of higher purpose of the novel, but the deeper problems that we're facing with regard to slavery, and they reveal the the sort of natures and importance of the various characters. So, I mean, maybe those conversations actually could have taken place, but. Um, well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I certainly would want to say, yes, they, they had to have taken place for, for some obvious reasons. And, and one way I'll convey yeah. this to you is to introduce something which we haven't all shared necessarily, but the new movie Harriet, which is the life of Harriet Tubman. I haven't seen it. <laughs> I, I recommend to everyone to see it as okay. soon as possible because it's powerful and you find a strong intersection with what Stowe is doing in that movie. And, and that's what creates the sense of validity to the whole project. But remember, Tubman, like Douglas, fled from slavery in Maryland, which was one of the milder forms of slavery when you think of the Deep South and the outrages that took place in Mississippi and other places. Uh, right. But the, the portrayal is so poignant, and it's not because of the actual treatment of the slaves. Some people think the movie is violent, but there's very little violence in it actually inflicted on the slaves. There's only descriptions of violence that happened mm -hmm. in the past. But the heart of the movie, and the part that intersects with what Stowe is doing, is it portrays the slow, steady degradation of the slave holder. Mm -hmm. How the slave holder is the person who is sub subject to such massive dislocation, change, and moral decay. And bringing that point home is a great part of what Cabin was about, and it shows the realism of it all insofar as we can say this movie is very close to the life of Tubman, and we have this from Douglas's biography as well, autobiography as well. We know these things happen. Huh. No, that's fascinating. 
Um, and again, you mentioned Fred Douglas. So in fact, earlier, Bill, when you were talking about the distinction between physical ownership or legal ownership in one sense and sole ownership, I had not heard that term. I love that term because it, it actually reminded me of uh, a theme in Fred Douglas's narrative, right, where he talks about the moment when he realizes that he may be in chains, but he, he will never actually be a slave. Yes. Because his mind has somehow been made uh, and been open to the possibility that he can, in fact, be free. And that follows that follows shortly after his experience with that mistress in Baltimore, who accidentally, or maybe out of the kindness of her heart at the beginning, remember she's angelic at the beginning, she teaches him how to read. And then after her husband chastises her, you see, you see the effect of slavery on this once angelic woman who becomes like a demon, you know, toward him. So yeah, that's, so that's interesting, yeah. these parallel themes. Um, and, and so therefore, Tom becomes realistic when you see him in light of what Frederick Douglass experienced. Mm -hmm. Real life confirms the novel. The, the idea that Tom was passive, that he accepted the conditions of slavery, is simply a mistaken appreciation of the novel. As he says in chapter 11, when young George comes to him and he's being carried off by Haley, he says, look, I don't want you to beat this man up. We've got to think about me. <laughs> I know where I am. I know my situation. I'm not blind to this stuff. Let's not make him treat me any worse than he's going to do anyway, while I patiently work to master these circumstances, which mm. he goes on in chapter 12 to demonstrate he does. He makes Haley depend on him rather than the reverse. Yeah. You know, I think one scene that really shatters the notion of of Tom is is is, is passive and reactive. Is we have to remind ourselves that he is concealing uh, the secret of the two runaways from from Legree. He knows um, what they're doing, and he keeps that secret to protect them, which you know requires an incredible amount of will and resolve. Uh, so he's not just doing it, you know, for himself or for his um, religious. Uh, for his religious faith, but but he's doing so out of um, to protect uh, those two young women. Huh. So That's a great that, point, David. That, that is so true that it, in fact, it, what it does is reinforce the very opening of the novel when he advises uh, George's wife to flee, Eliza, to flee, and he says very clearly, "It ain't natural for her to stay." Yeah. He never endorses people avoiding escaping slavery. He said, some people can't bear it. That's his words. I can bear it. She can't. Mm. He understands the condition he's in. He understands the challenge he faces. People who can't survive that, he says, get out. Mm. So he doesn't just conceal the identities of Cassie and Evangeline. He, in fact, inspires them to undertake the escape. Mm. He tells them to do it. He's a, an activist, not a passive person at all. It's fascinating. So we got a, a couple of questions on yes, the, the I was just gonna... we might be able to roll together. And, and, and one is, um, how were they able to distribute so many copies, which is a way of uh, addressing um, the impact the book had uh, upon its publication and its many, many uh, reprintings. Uh, and it, 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 in a way, relates to a question about, is, is this Stowe's way of saying abolition now? And this is pitting her uh, against the, the gradualists. And one way to address that uh, second question is is to consider the review the novel received in England in a liberal Catholic journal, The Rambler, in, in November of 19, uh, 1852, in which the, the reviewer um, criticizes Stowe first for using fiction uh, to make an attack on slavery, uh, mm -hmm. but then more harshly criticizes her for assuming that immediate abolition is necessary when, in fact, according to the reviewer, uh, enslaved people need to be prepared for freedom by experiencing or going through a phase of ever milder involuntary servitude until they're they're finally freed. So I mean, you know, Stowe's intentionality gets pushed back. The novel gets pushed back from people on both sides of the Atlantic who who are not supportive of immediate abolition as, yeah. as Stowe is. And in terms of getting the the number of uh, uh, issues or editions out, the copies, um, the publisher was, was scrambling to put them out. And there were many different editions uh, available. And in fact, in that Rambler review, the, the reviewer notes that going into a London bookshop, he had his choice of which <laughs> to, 
to uh, to pick up, and there was even a deluxe edition shortly after the novel's first appearance. And we should also note that Stowe modified uh, later editions. She did revise um, some of the dialect uh, of her African American characters. So mm. there are variations of the text that um, are spreading throughout throughout the South. But it was it was a bestseller uh, of its day for sure. Yeah. And it was a, an immediate success in a certain way, right, David? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. The 1852 text is, remains as authoritative despite the intervening versions and variations. And it's very important uh, to take note that the novel was largely pirated. Copyright laws were not then what they are now. And so in terms of distribution, it was widely distribution, distributed in part because there was no copyright protection. And, and it was so immediately popular that throughout the whole world, it began to appear both in translation and in pirated English copies. Mm. So it seems to me this question of distribution, remember, as you pointed out at the opening, the national era serialization had already established its popularity. So that when it appeared in book form, it simply continued on a cresting wave. The wave was initiated by the national era, which is an abolitionist serialization. Uh -huh. mm. That's where it starts out. Huh. And another, That's fascinating. Another detail, historical detail to fold in here. The book had an outsized cultural impact through the popularity of theatrical adaptations over which Stowe had no creative control. Oh, no. I doubt she received any royalties, but the book was <laughs> um, staged and it, it's not the sort of novel that can be staged in full. So Mm -hmm. All of the uh, adapters were, were making creative choices about how to slice and dice, if you will, the Stowe's story. Uh, but the, the collective impact of the, of the traveling theatrical shows, probably even bigger than the novel itself, since it reached mm -hmm. a wider audience than even uh, its readership. That's fascinating. The result of that, which we must not fail to observe, is that those who staged the Tom shows did not maintain fidelity to the structure mm -hmm. of the novel. Mm -hmm. and they didn't reinforce the stereotypes, right. of the moral and spiritual dilemmas that were developed over the course of the novel. When we yes. talk about the criticisms from Europe of Stowe, we forget that at the heart of her book, and again in the 1878 introduction, she specifically addresses these things. She denies the truth of the claim about a human exception or people in their knowledge needing to be shepherded into freedom. She takes that on directly in the novel, mm. as well as in her correspondence with people in Britain. So they don't get away with criticizing her without being answered by her. She has a response, a philosophical response to these claims. Mm. That's so, fascinating. So when we see what's happening with the, the stage plays, the Tom shows, they are actually a retail diversion from the real action, the real moral philosophical yeah of the novel. And they continued, by the way, to appear on the stages in the United States until 1956. Yeah. Having originated originally in 1852, there was not a single day since, between, until 1956, there wasn't somewhere in the United States a Tom Show play. Hmm. Amazing. That's amazing. And yeah, uh, your bill, on your point, I mean, the, uh, you know, those the stage plays became, in ways, parodies of uh, yes. the novel, right? Because they they exaggerated what, you know, what they th thought were sort of the characteristics of the various characters yes. uh, in, in dramatic style, but they, they totally shed the, the sort of deeper, more principled dilemmas, right, that were, that, that, uh, that Stowe was trying to tackle in her novel. So can I just, can I be unserious for a second? Um, this is not serious, but I, but it, it, it just, you just sparked a memory in my, <laughs> as I get older, I forget these things. But when I was growing up, I didn't read uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin until high school. But I remember growing up watching a Little Rascals episode. Do you remember the old black and white uh, Little Rascals uh, TV shows? And there's an episode where they put on a, a production of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yes, I'm not sure if you remember that episode, but um, I do remember all that. <laughs> yeah, but that but that's the sort of um, stereotyping uh, that that you know even I mean of course even it's even more stereotype because it's just a bunch of little kids 
uh, you know, putting it on, but, but that, but that, so I was shocked uh, when I read the novel for the first time, um, not realizing just how, how, uh, how deep the thought required of one reading the novel, how, how much thought is actually required of the reader uh, to, to work through these dilemmas. Um, so it's a testament to her skill uh, as a philosophical novelist that one of her great admirers was Fedor Dostoevsky, who is probably the greatest novelist, novelist at least in wow. my opinion, who's able to blend philosophy and fiction and memorable, vivid, rounded uh, characters. Yeah, that's amazing. I did not know that either. And Dave, David, you mentioned the the review that we put up for uh, participants to look at. Um, did you recommend that? I'm not sure who recommended this. Uh, I did. Mm -hmm. But this is fascinating, this review, because they begin by acknowledging uh, her skill as a novelist, right? But where she falls short is her assessment of the problem, the evil of slavery, right? And what ought to be done about it. And I was I know this is slightly off top of off trajectory here, but um, you mentioned this earlier, Dave, and I wanted to point this out. I was a little shocked. I mean, as a political scientist, I guess I shouldn't be shocked at anything, but I was shocked at some of the arguments that were made against her and how much they sort of bordered on a defense of slavery itself. Um, I happen to have pulled up in front of me, uh, it's page 416 in the review, uh, where they were actually saying, look, um, uh, ch chattel slavery in America is not is not nearly as bad as um, uh, the slavery of antiquity, and they start quoting the Romans and you know, uh, or looking at Roman slavery, um, which is of course is exactly the opposite argument that Stowe would make, and and even you know of course Abraham Lincoln and others made right, um, and Frank Douglas himself would make. And this is this is not an atypical response. In fact. I, I published a review recently of the New York Times version of the 1619 project, in which I explained mm -hmm. in detail that actually they are recreating the positive goods argument for slavery without even realizing they're doing it. That's right. It's consistent with what they did with their origins in the early 1850s when the New York Times began, and they took the positive good approach in some ways. So yeah. it's really an odd paradox of history. Yes. These arguments resurface all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's, I'm I'm amazed at how many people inadvertently um, argue that uh, that uh, Justice Taney was right in the Dred Scott decision, right? And they're uh, they fall right into it. But uh, and you mentioned the. Uh, I yeah. Think one, of, one question I see here, and it's rather long, but I'm trying to read it. But my screen is small, so hopefully I get it right. But I think it's important. The religious aspect of quoting scripture to slaves that the slave owner would go to church and we know go home and rape a female slave is the real degradation, I think it needs to say there, of a human. There's little room to come back from that conduct. That moral decay is inhuman. Yet the German translation made it seem that it was so powerful in helping people endure all sorts of desolation and despair so that the religion of Christ can, be, can enable the poorest and most ignorant human being not merely to submit, but triumph. The soul can become strong and rise above every threat in assurance of, of an ever-present love and an immortal life. Quoting Heinrich Heine. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Bill? I wanted to pull that out because Stowe was aware and had some comment, contact, contact slight to be sure with Heine and appreciation for Heine. But, but it seems to me that is a misrepresentation of that particular passage of what's going on. It wasn't poor and weak people who triumphed. It was the argument that people of strength cannot be overcome, even by the worst of mm. slavery. That's what the story is in Uncle Tom's Cabin. It is a defense of the human. And yes, it is, of course, a presentation of the power of Christian faith and the example of Christ. But it is, above all, a defense of the human itself. So that the people who suffer degradation suffer a self-imposed degradation. They're mm -hmm. not victims of someone else. They are victimizing themselves. Mm -hmm. This whole notion of seeing slaves only as victims is ultimately dehumanizing. And that's what still accomplishes through her novel. She says, if you can only see the slave as a victim, you don't see the slave as a human being. Yeah. 
they're not therefore prepared to advance emancipation. Yeah, that's fascinating. You know, to, to, to build off that, that great commentary and, and to connect it to another question, um, someone else asked, um, how important is it that, that Stowe was a woman? Could a man have written this novel? And I think we can use that question to explore her presentation of female characters. It's quite varied. I think that um, the array of female characters Stowe deploys in the novel uh, has far more range than, than even the male characters. Uh, consider the uh, character of Marie St. Clair, who is an odious character and, and quite unpleasant, but still memorable uh, in her constant whining and, and solipsism. And then there's the character of Ava, her daughter, and uh, Augustine St. Clair's uh, daughter who, who dies. And, and that portion of the novel has received a lot of criticism as being um, hyperbolic and maudlin and an example of the, the worst features of 19th century uh, American literature uh, with this, this angelic little uh, girl, uh, you know, cutting uh, locks of her hair to distribute. But, but I think if we go with Stowe's intentionality, she's working off the trope of the, the innocence of a child. And it's Ava really who sees um, the dehumanizing effects of slavery on, on everybody. Uh, and in, in, in her own way, she's very Christ-like and, you know, when she embraces Topsy and, and, and can't believe that Topsy has no family and just has this outpouring of, of empathy for her. And so it's, it's a creative choice having Ava die. Yes, that's, that's a little bit over the top, but, but it's also a way of, of, of showing the, the enormous um, evil power of slavery to destroy the soul. Yeah, and again, it's... I was just going to add one quick comment, Chris. Please, I'm sorry, Bill. So that people understand how to appraise those uh, characterizing people. The notion that she didn't know how to portray innocence in the real world by looking at Eva ignores the power of her presentation in her novel Old Town Folks, where she has also this mm -hmm. innocent young woman and drive her through the growth to maturity, the temptations of the world, the romanticism, Rousseauianism, disappointment, and even nihilism and show her emerging with strength. She had the full range of character representation at her disposal. So we have to, as David said, look at her intentionality. She was not writing melodramatically because she didn't know how to write any other way. She did it because it fit what she needed to do in that context. Yeah, well, that's great. That's a great point. I, I'm, um, this, this will be a little bit of a, di a diversion, I apologize, but next semester I'm teaching late modern political thought to my undergrads and and we usually end by reading some Richard Rorty. Um, and uh, I know I, familiar with him, but um, to be totally unfair to his argument and to summarize for the sake of time, um, uh, one of the things he calls for is the use of narrative to to persuade people, to move people emotionally towards toward uh, your point of view or your goals and and not bothering with reasoning about things right because reason uh if there is such a thing reason is usually counterproductive to the to uh, persuading somebody to just feel what you feel right um so it seems to me that what harriet beecher stowe is doing and i'm not sure that she's the first but she's i don't think she's the first maybe among American authors, but she, like um, some of the um, um, uh, muckrakers later, or some of the uh, novelists from the progressive era, uh, do a good job of, of combining thought with emotion. Um, and not, not, not simply like Rorty and others, more moderns saying, it has to be just emotion and you leave thought out. Um, she's she does a great job of combining both and the emotional part is sometimes the jarring thing with you know the things that happen to the characters that you were just mentioning uh david for example is often the thing that jars us uh so much that we then um uh have to confront the the principled questions that she's presenting to us and demands us to think about in a way right so i love the way she combines both she demands of the reader that they feel, but at the same time that they think, and it's not simply one or the other. Uh, and that's the mark of, to me, of a great 
influential novelists. And I'm thinking of, um, again, um, others others who have done done a good job of this. Um, some of the, um, uh, again, writers of the progressive era, um, just drawing a blank on some of their names right now, but uh, some novelists can do this really well. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking of a, a quote from um, a letter from Thomas Jefferson, actually, when he was writing to his his contact in uh, England uh, uh, and Jefferson wrote to him saying, get this book and this book and this book for me. And his agent wrote back saying, why do you want fiction? And, and uh, J Jefferson's response was because um, good fiction um, can move the human heart in ways that a treatise can't. Uh, a treatise can move the head, but good fiction can move the heart in, in the right direction. And he quotes, for example, who can read, who, who can read Macbeth without feeling, you know, uh, the, the, the sensation of, uh, or, or without thinking that, uh, you know, Lady Macbeth is not an inhuman monster or something like that. It teaches us something about humanity by giving us examples of, of what it means to be a human being. I'm paraphrasing Jefferson's letter now. So it seems like Stowe does a great job of that. Uh, even in the exaggerated moments, perhaps. But and interestingly, what, what you quote from Jefferson is precisely the same thing the philosopher Montesquieu says in the Persian Letters. Right? Ah, that's right. And again, yeah. in 1827, is what Calvin Stowe says in his dissertation on the use of wit. <laughs> and, ah, and perfect. He lays out precisely the program that Harriet Stowe subsequently follows. And so when he says to her, in the 1840 period, look, you've got to get more to writing these things because you're really good at this. You yeah. literature to this effect, and these things come forward from your pen and, and really influence the world. So yeah. this was a dynamic, interactive framework in which they were reinforcing one another on precisely that ground. And yeah. so, so let me just go back to the one question. Could any of male writers in the United States in the 19th century have done what she did? And my answer to that question is not because they didn't do it not because they lacked literary capacity. They they did it because they, for whatever reason, couldn't take the political risk that she did. Because we know some of uh, the, the Melville and Emerson and others and Hawthorne had views about these questions. They couldn't yeah. quite tackle them so directly and explicitly and overtly because it was a political risk. She took that political risk and was able to get away with it, partly because of the reasons David has described about the nature of her literature, her power, her, her ability to her, her portraiture, uh, her, her, her dramatic representation. She simply had amassed an arsenal of weapons that was unsurpassed. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, somebody, and in fact, uh, Danita just uh, put in the chat box, even Dickens said Stowe went too far Yes. She seeks to prove too much. The wrongs and atrocities of slavery are, God knows, case enough. Dickens thinks she may repel some useful and sympathetic support. And Dickens, of course, uses emotion and facts to make people feel too. So, Precisely. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the political the, the, risk the, aspect I had not thought of. Um, uh, Dickens, uh, the comparison is, is especially relevant because Stowe builds into the story and into the characters comparison of race-based slavery in the United States with the exploitation of industrial workers in the north of the United States and in Great Britain uh, as well. So this is represented um, in the conversations between Ophelia, uh, who is from Vermont, uh, and, and she's philosophically opposed to slavery, but she freely admits her racial prejudice. Her conversations with her uh, cousin, uh, Augustine St. Clair, who I think is perhaps the most interesting, most well-developed character because he's, he's really nuanced and complex. I mean, he's got just such a, a vivid mix of yeah. uh, attractive as well as repellent qualities. And uh, mm. in another element of the novel, and, and this is where, again, Stowe's criticized for being obvious, but uh, Augustine has a twin brother who's also a slave owner, but he's a very harsh slave owner. And they have this conversation when they're at the at the lake house during the hot months of the summer in New Orleans, where uh, Augustine's brother is making the forceful argument that slavery will always exist. It must exist that the enslaved have no capacity for their for their own 
their own uh, affairs for their own lives. And, and so that's representing, you know, durable um, debates of the era, but doing so through those characters. That's fascinating. Yeah. It's a great, great, great point. Even, even Liberty was defended by John Stuart Mill at that very time period on the grounds of it being acceptable for some civilized people, but not for other people. Yeah. Their knowledge. Right. <laughs> right. Yes. Uh, fascinating. The, 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 the intellectual shifts that are taking place at the time uh, that she's writing this novel are also, I mean, it's just amazing to think of all the things that are coming yeah. uh, into, into modern thinking, modern thought and philosophy at this time. Uh, really fascinating. Um, um, somebody asked in the chat uh, box if, if there was uh, any relation, um, how did they put it, a connection between uh, uh, St Beecher Stowe and Harriet Tubman? Do we know? None that we are aware of. None, not that we're aware of, okay. Remember, Tubman's career essentially starts um, late in the 50s going just a couple of years before the outbreak of the war, in fact. Okay. So it's subsequent to the primary influence of Stowe. That's right. That's right. It reminds me, um, Bill, David, maybe one of you will know this. Um, we know, right, Harriet Beecher Stowe met Abraham Lincoln, mm -hmm. right? He invited her and her family to, to the White House. And I think she took along her sisters. Um, and it may be apocryphal, but but the 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 the, the rumor is that when uh, Lincoln greeted her, he said, "Ah, this is the little lady who started the war." Do we is that true or not, or is that just great uh, great myth making? It is true in the sense in which historical memory makes it true. That's perfect. <laughs> well said, Bill. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> if it isn't true, it should be. <laughs> you know, her son would later say, yes, it happened. But um, as, as many scholars have pointed out in, in preparing a biography of his mother, the first two editions, he never mentioned it. And you would find that curious if such a, a remarkable exchange took place. Uh -huh. um, there is an article by the scholar uh, Daniel Villaro, um, which was published 10 years ago in the journal, the Abraham Lincoln Association. And this is a, a very detailed um, presentation to show that 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 this exchange never took place that, uh -huh. that Lincoln never said that even though they did meet but but Bill nailed it I mean it's it's it speaks to Uncle Tom's cabin's cultural impact and, yeah. and its legacy so um, we want it to be true because it, it speaks to this larger um, actual historical development great points great points um, um so she starts writing this novel um, and again she's been writing for a while as, as you both pointed out there's a larger body of her work which is just very good um does the novel she starts i guess they come out in the newspaper in 51 and i think then the book is published in its first form in 52. Right, it's march 52. is that right 1852 okay and the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 is just prior to this. Do we do we know? Is there any evidence to suggest that um, she was um, hastened into writing, or maybe that's not the right word, uh, quickened into writing the book in light of what she thought was a worsening uh, scenario in the United States with regard to slavery, and maybe particularly with the 1850 Fugitive Slave Act? I think that's fair. Is it okay? We can say that for sure. Okay. Remember, the, the two altars for a short story appeared in 1842, and, and that already had drawn up the contrast between liberty and union. Are you going to save union or save liberty? Because she started out with that. And so, so by the time you get to 1850, it seems decisively we're sacrificing liberty for union. And, and so in that context, she's reacting to it, to be sure, among many others who are reacting to it. Yeah. And, and of course, she would have been among the people who would have been in danger of prosecution for helping slaves escape if she hadn't shortly after that left Cincinnati to go up to Bowdoin, Maine, because her husband took the position at Bowdoin College, where she finished writing Uncle Tom's Cabin. Yeah. 
So yes, she, she's in the thoroughly suffused with this aura, this, this environment in which the Fugitive Slave Act is making criminals of Yankees who are giving aid and comfort to escaped slaves. Yeah. And I think that's her, you know, her, her awareness uh, of that and her intent to include it in the story uh, presents the, the weakest part uh, of the novel, the, the two slave catchers who are, are close on the trails of, of Eliza mm -hmm. and, and her son. Uh, and, and we have this really repellent character who boasts of his ability to convince judges that he is the, the owner of these individuals they capture. Uh, even if they are free. And so here we see Stowe showing us one of the uh, effects, the results of the Fugitive Slave Act and how it's leading to criminality across the North and making the North a major participant in the maintenance yes. of, of slavery and the expansion of federal power to protect it. But there's a great potential for her as a novelist to develop this storyline and it, it just falls away. And, and we have the, the rather unconvincing um, outcome in which um, the partner uh, falls, um, he's pushed and, and, and falls and hurts himself and the Quakers save him and he has a change of heart. And it's, it's not very convincing. It's also a delayed part of the story where she leaves that aside to take up Tom's story and doesn't return to it for a while. And, and so it, I think it's the weakest part of the novel, but still it's an important part of the novel because it shows the effects of the Fugitive Slave Act. Fascinating. Yeah, I was thinking um, when I brought up the Fugitive Slave Act, I, I was thinking of the letter um, uh, that we again posted for the readings today, uh, her letter to uh, to Goodloe, uh, which if, is written in 1853. Um, but I found this letter fascinating. So again, it's after the novel had been published, but it was still again shortly after uh, the Fugitive Slave Act and and the turn in the minds of a lot of abolitionists, especially that the country was now really heading in the wrong direction. But I found this letter fascinating and I had not read this before. Um, so uh, thank you for whichever of you suggested this letter. Um, but she begins this letter by talking about uh, uh, the feelings toward her from the South um, and how uh, they, um, she has a kind of respect she says, for the true chivalric noble ideal of the Southern man. Um, but, they, but they're but they very hostile to her, obviously. And uh, her, her defense of herself is that sh they should think of her as a friend uh, because friendship means um, sometimes doing the hard thing of pointing out the faults of your other, of your friends, right? Um, and so that's what she claims to have been doing in part in the novel. And it was not meant to be hostile toward southerners uh it was not meant to uh be uh, uh um I'm trying to think of the right word here it was not meant to condemn them necessarily as 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 human beings but insofar as they are friends i suppose civic friends being part of the same country she was trying to point out their their faults and then the the this third or fourth paragraph really struck me as she's speaking or writing in these terms, she says, the same is true of my country. I fix my heart on the bright ideal of America as she should be, and therefore condemn most unsparingly that part of her course and conduct, which is unworthy of this ideal. And I just thought that that reminded me a bill so much in particular of your argument um, about her motives, uh, because she's a friend of America, uh, what she calls here the bright ideal of America. Uh, one of the purposes of the novel was to, was as a friend to America, point out the flaws of America in order to make America better. I just thought this was a, a really interesting way of uh, of thinking about her purposes. Um, in, in the, at the end of the day, you know, I think it's fair to say the struggle over slavery was a struggle for America. Hmm. And the real subject was not the slaves. But it was America. Yeah. Throughout, she mm -hmm. understood that, and so so you're right in pointing to that. And and, and David brought this letter to us, but it, it is a very important letter, and one that conveys very concisely 
the, the real power that drove her forward. And I think if we try to understand her work in that context, we'll be more patient with any kind of what others might see as dramatic lapses. You know, when the critic uh, Edmund Wilson dismisses her as being just melodramatic, he's really only identifying his incapacity to recognize true power in art. <laughs> and that's how we need to understand these things. If we were in the hands of a master in the yeah. past, so, which means we start out by saying we probably don't understand what she's doing. We got yeah. close attention and be instructed by her before we can understand it. Well, how often does that happen? That a great mind comes along and it takes a generation or two to fully appreciate them. Um, well, it happens to Melville for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I was even thinking of Lincoln. I, I mean, you know, it, um, it, it you know, um, people didn't appreciate him till he was gone. Uh, <laughs> a lot of people. Um, but um, somebody asked earlier um, about the effects of her uh, work on the South and um, how 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 this was taken by the South and what effect did it have, if any, on the slaveholding mind, if you will. Well, the work divided, of course, the South. There were some people in the South who read it with appreciation but they usually did so furtively when they read it. It came out under broad sides of attack, obviously, because the, the Southerners saw themselves as being undermined. But remember, it is now, by the time Uncle Tom's Cabin appeared, it's been a period of at least 20 years where the South has been building up a defense of slavery, a positive, good defense of slavery. Mm -hmm. This, in that historical moment, is a huge solar plexus blow. Mm -hmm. That they were trying to develop. Uh, and it undercuts it completely, puts an end to it. So we need to see it in that larger framework to understand what happened. That's a great point. So the official reaction at the South was outrage. And it yeah. produced even from so from from women <laughs> attempts to respond to her, who, who began by criticizing her for writing this while being a woman. <laughs> mm -hmm. and so so, so the, the the official posture of what we might call elite opinion in the South was do everything we can to discredit this work. And it yeah. was ultimately unsuccessful. They could not discredit it. I have not thought of it that way. I'm we sorry, though, I didn't mean to cut you off. Who read it furtively and were greatly moved and affected by it. Uh, and remember Francis Lieber, the philosopher, who was at that time still in Charleston. He, his original appointment, in the, he was a German emigrate. Right. His original appointment was at the College of what, comes now the University of South Carolina, but, but there in <laughs> Columbia. And he read it and, and penned a review of it, which he never published. I uncovered this in manuscripts at the Huntington <laughs> Library, in which he was profoundly moved by it. Mm. And, and he, 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 he describes it in terms that are so elegiacal, its power and, and the, the character of Uncle Tom, that it seems almost excessive. But of course, he also ends that review by not by acknowledging what can one do. Yeah. <laughs> so so, so that I say summarizes what happened in the South. And he yeah. shortly thereafter left and relocated and became a professor at Columbia University, not in South Carolina, but in New York, at <laughs> King's College which became Columbia. Right. So he was then liberated and ultimately could draft for the Union the laws of war. And yeah. defended the whole idea of union which defined the fact that the war was a war for the Union. Huh. That transition took place in that person's life, which in a way is illustrative of the power that the novel had. That's amazing. Yeah, I had, I had thought, I was just gonna say really quick, I had not thought about uh, the effect in that larger sense that the novel had in the North among, among the many Northerners who were not themselves simply anti-slavery, right? right. And maybe some of them may have been inclined toward in, uh, accepting the positive good argument and your point about this cutting that off at least in the northern mind that's a that's a huge fact because what it made possible was uh in in a way um you may still be left with a number a number of northerners who they didn't buy the positive good argument um they may still have been slightly indifferent or entirely indifferent to slavery but that's a better position for somebody like Lincoln or others to work with or work on than to have to argue in a way with 
uh, or, uh, you know, the positive good argument. You can maybe make more way. I don't know. Maybe I'm stretching it too far, but that's a. You're not stretching it at all. Okay, you? good. <laughs> uh, Overlook. We, we, yeah. we see Dred Scott and we see the opinion issued in Dred Scott as being a revolutionary moment, something dramatically turned. But we don't remember that Tani, before he became Chief Justice, was an Associate Justice who in 19, 1842, in Craig versus Pennsylvania, had already signaled the decision he made in Dred Scott. He had yeah. in a dissent, in a case he yeah. otherwise approved of, because the outcome satisfied the pro-slavery position. But the principle enunciated by Story and Craig was that slavery is sectional, freedom is national. Right. Tani saw in that the threat to slavery, and in his dissent, he attacked it. And that's why he comes in Dred Scott in 1857 and reverses it and says slavery is national. Yeah. Local. Fascinating. So, so it's in the face of that that these things are taking place, and she undercuts that yeah. more culturally. So by the time of Dred, it has no cultural purchase, even though it becomes law. That's how important it was. That puts a great point on the on the importance and the impact of her work in in this whole mix of arguments that's going on with regard to slavery and the expansion of slavery. Right, and from, so. from a historian's point of view, you know, the big question uh, about uh, the novel is uh, <laughs> what impact did it have in in the bringing of the Civil War? And, and this is something a lot of scholars have, have taken up, and David Reynolds, for example, in a book about 10 years ago, argued that the novel clearly was a factor in, in the coming of the, of the conflict um, because of the theatrical productions as well as the cultural impact, uh, the mm -hmm. cultural undercutting of the legal argument that, that mm -hmm. he makes. And I think to, to, to circle back to the, to the ways in which he's speaking to Northern readers, we have the uh, subplot of uh, Ophelia, the, the female uh, woman, the female um, cousin uh, who comes south to help take care of Ava and, and ends up adopting uh, Topsy. And, you know, this is kind of a submerged part of the story, but it, it's a significant one because Ophelia comes not knowing very much at all about African Americans. And she, as I mentioned earlier, admits her racial prejudice and she's horrified at the, at the figure of of Topsy and thinks her cousin is playing a joke on her, a cruel joke, by purchasing Topsy and saving her from uh, the horrific situation uh, she's in, being abused by restaurant owners. But uh, by the novel's end, Ophelia has convinced Augustine to give her custody, and she essentially adopts Topsy and, and raises her, and she becomes a free person uh, with a fully developed life. I mean, that's reported at the end of the novel in, in sort of a hurried way. Um, mm -hmm. But but I think through that device, Stowe is telling us, look, you know, Northerners have to change their views too, and they have to, to, to look at uh, what uh, beliefs they have and ask whether they're legitimate. Yeah, that's a great, great point. And, and uh, she has to give them totems that they can mm -hmm. recognize. And you get many of those throughout the novel, and that's one example, Topsy, who doesn't emigrate, who becomes an effective missionary soul in the United States. That's a totem. And then there are several of those spread throughout the novel. Yeah. Yeah, another another great point. And boy, we are out of time. It just flies by, but it, 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 um, it, it David, you brought up um, the, the need to change attitudes of among Northerners, um, not just with, with regard to slavery, but I know you've you've written on um, uh, Northern attitudes with regard to to blacks, right? Especially around World War One and at that time with the, with the riots and things like that. So it's it would be really great to see if we could trace any sort of future influence of uh, of, of Beecher Stowe's thought uh, and the future of of race in the country but uh, that's probably a webinar for another time so <laughs> that's another big one but uh i want to thank you both again very much uh for your thoughts this has been extremely enlightening i have learned so much and i'm grateful to you both for this um and and you've both mentioned several uh recommended several things to read for further reading throughout this webinar so when people get their link to the the video and audio archive they can go back and listen to this and, and maybe look up some of the the articles and texts that you've both recommended. So last, well, we can, last we can, thoughts or words? We that they should start with Bill's book. 
Absolutely. Yes. Rethinking Uncle Tom's Cabin. And, and the book by David Reynolds I mentioned is entitled Might Mightier Than the Sword, Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Battle for America. And the article on the um, uh, apocryphal exchange between Lincoln and uh, Stowe is by Daniel Vallaro, V-O-L-L-A-R-O, -L -L in the Journal of the Abraham Lincoln Association. That's available online. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And I would give just one last reflection to refer back to the person who asked the question about George Washington thinking that slavery was going to die away. I want to reassure you that was not Washington's position. He, in fact, at the end, was in despair that he couldn't get what he wanted, which were the legislative resolves to end slavery. And when he released his own slaves, it was in the face not of the expectation that it was going to simply disappear, but that nothing else was happening and he at least could give this testimony to his country that something needed to happen. Yeah, oh, that's a great point. Yeah, uh, um, I always think of the language that Lincoln, the specific link, language that Lincoln used to describe the intent of people like Jefferson and Washington, which was not to just do nothing and it would go away, but to put it on a path. Yes. Which requires some degree of action on their part right. to write, so. Thank you, Bill, for that clarification. And again, gentlemen, thank you both so much. This was uh, absolutely fantastic. Really appreciate your time, and thank I you, look Chris. forward to our next opportunity to to talk. So, wish you both the best. Um, thank you, and yeah. thanks to thanks to everybody who joined us today. These were great questions, um, really thoughtful. They really moved the conversation along. So, I, I really appreciate those questions. Um, remember uh, the link that you'll get in an email will be coming soon. Uh, if you enjoyed today's webinar and these webinars in general that we do, uh, please look into the other resources that Ashbrook provides, including free one-day seminars in over 20 states. Uh, these seminars are based entirely on original documents. They're entirely discussion-based, similar to what we do here and in, in our classes and other things. So you can find the full list of these scheduled seminars by state on the tah.org website. Just click on seminars at the top of the screen, select one day seminars as the category. Um, and if you like these things that we do, please spread the word about our programs by sharing the archive link uh, that you'll get in the email coming up soon. Share that with your colleagues and on social media. So again, thanks to everybody for being here. Our next Saturday webinar will be on Frederick Douglass on January 11th, first webinar of the year 2020. So until then, um, wish you all the best. Take care. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another TAH.org podcast. You can find archives of all our previous programs, as well as information about future programs at TAH.org slash webinars, or on iTunes by searching for teachingamericanhistory.org.